lo quiero. Yes, it has come. We are side. Some of you are the same. 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 Clara. Clara, can you hear me? Yes, bro. Can, can we go? Can we go? Can go ahead to start it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good uh, morning or afternoon or evening, everyone, depending where you are. My name is Jean Machega. Uh, I'm professor of medicine at University of Stellenbosch, also hold appointment at University of Pittsburgh at John Hopkins University. It's my, my pleasure and honor to welcome you uh, today uh, for an important, uh, very uh, uh, topical uh, subject on Ebola, ongoing Ebola in Uganda. Uh, I would like uh, to briefly introduce my co-moderator, uh, Professor Francis Omaswa, who is the director of uh, the Center for Global Health and Social Transformation in Kampala, Uganda. Uh, he, he, he is an achieved investigator. Uh, uh, I, will, I will let him uh, take on and introduce properly he, himself, and then he will introduce our first speaker. Francis, it's up to you. Yes, uh, good morning, good evening, and uh, I don't know, some of us are in the middle of the night somewhere in Japan, country or Thailand or something like that. I want to greet you and to thank you all for joining this uh, a very important Afri Health uh, webinar on the current situation of uh, the Ebola outbreak in uh, my country, Uganda. Uh, we have uh, an expert panel of people on this subject in this webinar. You could hardly get any better than the people we have here today, and we will be introducing them. Uh, 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 Jean Jacques Muyembe from the DRC uh, is the discoverer of uh, Ebola, and he's got vast experience in treating this disease. Dr. Sam Okware is uh, managed the, a large number of Ebola outbreaks 
and has written several books on this topic. Uh, the uh, incident manager, Henrik Chobe from Uganda is right in it now, he's in the middle of managing the Ebola outbreak. So uh, we could hardly get any better team of people to take us forward. Let's start with the hearing uh, from Dr. Uh, um, Colonel Henrik Chobe on the current uh, status of the Ebola outbreak in Uganda. Dr. Kyobe is a commissioned military officer, a lieutenant colonel at that, and a medical doctor, of course, a researcher, and will become a leader in this field as the years go by. He's still quite young compared to some of us, and looking forward, there will be the people taking over leadership on this topic uh, from uh, the rest of us. He's a, a, a researcher, and the current, as I've said, the incident manager in charge of the Ebola outbreak here. He was uh, uh, transferred from the army uh, in Uganda to the Ministry of Health uh, to lead this disease because of his, uh, to lead this uh, um, uh, COVID outbreak in the first instance, and not COVID, I mean, uh, yeah, COVID, and now yeah. Ebola. Uh, and, uh, you know, we couldn't get a better person to tell us exactly uh, how things are. And uh, uh, without much ado, I would like now to invite uh, uh, Dr. Kano Henry Kyobe Bosa uh, to address us. And I will say more about him as the meeting progresses. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kyobe Bosa, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. For Maswa, and thank you so much, Professor Nishiga and uh, uh, colleagues, my fellow panelists, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, Professor Muyembe. I, I can't say how much delighted I am to be part of this panel, to stand or to sit alongside uh, great people like you to speak on the on this topic. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> at a glance, uh, the current outbreak in Uganda. In the ninth week of the response, we have 141 cases on admission. We have only seven on hospitalization. And we have had 55 deaths and 79 recoveries. And we had 22 probable cases, 20 individuals that died before the outbreak was unmasked, and two individuals we couldn't get their samples along the way. So currently, the outbreak epicenter, where we see the dark red, that is where the outbreak began. In the two districts of Muvena and Kassanda, what we see in green are three districts where the outbreak went, but we never had secondary transmission there. What we see as a small dot here is Kampala. We had a three clusters set up between Kampala and this neighboring huge peri-urban district of Wakiso, where we had uh, three initial clusters. And as I will show, that actually seemed to be extinguished as of now. Three weeks ago, we had another individual who moved to the southwestern part of the country. Uh, here again, massacre. we've not had secondary transmission. And we think we're about to retire this, this district. What we are keeping an eye on at the source of River Nairo here is Ginger, where again we have a small cluster where so far we've not seen secondary transmission or sustained transmission coming through. So, of interest, of course, now our main effort is on the two epicenter districts, which close to 42 days ago were placed under movement restriction. And that has helped us to shield Kampala and other major big cities from getting cases or individuals moving there. So just looking at how this is disputed, uh, the on admission, only seven individuals uh, admitted from the two epicenter districts and one individual from Kampala. And what we see in Kampala, because of aggressive efforts that I will demonstrate later, 
we are having very good clinical outcomes from individuals that we get in Kampala. In sharp contrast, at the epicenter, where individuals present late and we have significantly very poor, relatively poor clinical outcomes, as we see here. 45 recovery rate between 45 and 42. So uh, this is the temporal distribution, it's a physical distribution. Uh, here we see and we believe the outbreak most likely began somewhere at the beginning of August. We seem to have missed a couple of things, but we're able to pick it midway around September. And this is where we have uh, this is where we have this initial spike and the subsequent spike that happened with the intensified efforts of control. We had a lull. And then the spike, this large spike, is linked to one major spreader, super spreader event in at the one of the <clears throat> one of the epicenter districts, and this coincides far so with the with the the cases that came to Kampala. But maybe what I need to speak to is uh, since November twelfth, we've not had any new cases. And, the new cases coming through. Uh, we may think actually it's maybe we think it's a real a real lull because our surveillance system is up and running, and we have an end to end approach to make sure that we test all the alerts. Also, in the epicenter districts, all the dead bodies we test them for Ebola. Just in case we have an anonymous transmission chain, which we could have missed. And we are doing the same in Kampala, Masaka, where I showed in the southwestern part of the country. And this has started in Jinja. The aim here is to make sure that we don't miss any, any unmasked cluster. So we think this, this remission is real, and we will try and hold on to that. But this doesn't mean that uh, we are actually relaxing, knowing that uh, any case can actually come through. Just here to demonstrate the, the major events, as I showed earlier, but more importantly, in red here, the institution of lockdown, of lockdown of the epicenter districts, and that was subsequently followed by this spike in one of the districts. I'll have a one case study that I will demonstrate that led to this. And then now the current lull that we are having, and we think it's a real lull. So in case, in terms of distribution, it's majorly disease of young adults, but this is a shift from the beginning where it was actually a disease of children and women, signifying family and household transmission which later moved to facility based transmission and my case study will actually demonstrate that and uh, what we don't see except that single super spreader event transmit on transmission at barriers has been largely limited but here to show that uh, the outcomes uh, amongst children are actually significantly poor in this outbreak so to speak about the extremes of age but of course, the seniors, most likely the data noise, given the fewer numbers. But uh, of note, given the fact that it's predominantly disease of young adults, so far as we see in this country. But we see the children, actually, the outcomes are really very, very poor. So again, as I showed, these are the outcomes, the case fatality among the young children are standing at 59 percent close to 60 percent but adults are close to 40 percent combining both the confirmed and the probable cases and the picture doesn't change much uh, with the confirmed cases again seeing how the children initially where it was predominantly children at the beginning later we're having uh we are having later having uh adults and then now we are, we are having a, the disease mainly amongst, uh, amongst young adults. But here, seeing further that uh, children consistently 
in the intense transmission actually we had much much more more children 12 of them and we lost six of them but this now has been transitioned now with the in the current phase as we see uh so again to demonstrate the same among the students but i think this is not something that we we don't know and we think it is related to as we saw in uh, sierra leone that uh, even the introduction the introduction of pediatric guidelines actually we still had poor clinical outcomes at the time so in the current outbreak still we see further that uh, we see further that the early presentation is associated with the good clinical outcomes as opposed to late presentation as i showed earlier for a case in the kampala where we have good outcomes when individuals actually managed early without going the specifics of of care uh colleagues i have two i have two case studies to just want to demonstrate uh, the extent of the movement of the outbreak from the epicenter into the city which prompted the government or the response to impose a lockdown on the epicenter districts to shield and ensure that Kampala and the major cities actually remain sterile. Of this individual who moved from this epicenter district, Kassanda, and moved to the another district, a neighboring district, before coming to Kampala and setting up this cluster as we see that exposed this huge number of children in a go and that same cluster actually set up a huge cluster in Kampala demonstrating how things had moved or were moving very fast around Kampala. BA is the individual I spoke about from the epicenter. He transmitted to two and three individuals within the epicenter district. He moved to Kampala and transmitted to this individual, 81, C81, who actually quickly transmitted to his family here, transmitted to another individual and his family and other individuals. So this is a single cluster. And what we are talking about here is a matter of days. And the urgency that the response took was to quarantine all our contacts, which helped us to be able to nip further escalation or sustained transmission from this. Kampala, you needed up to 10 free clusters, and then things go loose and we lose, we lose optimum control. We were glad we were able to get all these contacts, isolated them. The good news is that we have had very good outcomes because we got them early as we did. The other individual is another individual, again, linked to that case, again, who a young boy, a young man who lived in a small town. and. Uh, he was very popular there. He went to one, one clinic. He had a problem with his testicle and treated, but we understand he was exposed there by the one individual. So he went to a smaller, he started having symptoms and is literally treated for some of these tropical diseases, as we know, typhoid. And we saw in this outbreak fever, and consistent epigastric pain, sadly, a, a feature or a symptom that we don't have on the case investigation form. And because we have broadly abdominal pain, and which you consistently see epigastric pain as a, one of the presenting symptoms here. This individual went to a video hall with the colleagues, but he was ill. He collapsed. They hopped him out and took him to another facility here where again he exposed other people he went home again further exposed other people in another small clinic in the center then later on this individual died he convulsed as our teams were actually getting him to facility to the facility but uh, again he exposed two of our health workers one of them actually died and one of them actually survived this individual was exhumed and this is the super spreading event that I spoke about around this case alone, linked to the previous case that went to Kampala, we have 41 individuals that fell sick and over 10 individuals who died.
As I wind up colleagues, the key observations that we see here, the low risk of transmission during the indolent dry stage emphasizes the importance of isolating contacts before they get in the, in the wet phase, and that helps transmission. And the case studies that I've shown here show that uh, a single super spreader event can actually ignite the clusters in the Kampala and the propagative is the subsequent propagative effect that we see in ginger and in subsequent massacre. And we think this is one of the highlights of the response. Further, we see slow cell conversion of contacts. And we think uh, this is not because of low effectivity, as people think low effectivity of, of Sudan Ebola virus, but potentially it led to the duration and the extent of the exposure and the clinical state of the individual and the role of some of these individuals have uh, with, with the case. And as I showed earlier that we are having more and more children affected and contributing near to one third of the total case load. And as I indicated, being home, family and household transmission as at the beginning, which later on shifted to facility level transmission and then sub Consequently, that's where we're having uh, young adults coming through. So we were seeing a rapid expansion of the outbreak from the epicenter to Kampala. It took only two weeks. But in West Africa, as we know, it took several weeks before the outbreak came into K from, from Kailahun into Freetown, into Conakry, and then Monrovia. But in Kampala, it took just two weeks to get to Kampala. And even where we had unelaborate identification of cases and quarantine of contacts, didn't take this again, didn't stop the expansion of outbreak into the other two major cities of Massacre and Kampala, highlighting a change of things that these days the rapid outbreaks move much, much faster than actually we can catch them. So again, we see contact tracing in an urban setting as we saw elsewhere, quite cumbersome. And as I said, that you need. 10 clusters, independent clusters in Kampala, and then you, you lose optimum control of the outbreak. And again, this speaks to a couple of things that we need to think through as public health leaders today. That the current tools that we apply in the countryside where out, all outbreaks begin, they're largely inapplicable or largely ineffective in urban settings. And we need to devise additional tools of response in the urban setting, not to copy cut, uh, to cut copy into the city, the same, the same interventions that we use in the countryside. In the end, colleagues, uh, the, we, in this response, it, it was a battle uh, between overreaction and another reaction, noting that we are just coming from the COVID pandemic and some of the measures that we're applying actually biting heavy on the populations and the population's losing confidence and their cooperation. So it is a very fine balance of response, at the same time making sure that we don't allow the outbreak to escalate. And that's why we had only limited movement to two to two epicenter districts. And we think this method is, is working. And thank you, and I yield back to you, Prof. Thank you so much. And over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Chobe. Uh, uh, that's um, uh, um, you made very many powerful points. The first and uh, to me the most important is that we haven't had a case for the last uh, more than two weeks. Uh, and then the other one is that um, the transmission uh, is challenging, particularly when it is in urban areas. And also that uh, 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 just one case can ignite clusters of infections uh, as long as they are able to move from one location to another. Uh, so we will be discussing your submission, but I think we will all be delighted uh, to, to learn that uh, it appears uh, the lull is genuine and real and that you have a very uh, awake uh, system uh, for monitoring the outbreak at the moment. Uh, let's move on to hear from uh, Dr. Sam Kware, uh, who is going to 
uh, talk to us uh, uh, about past uh, Ebola outbreaks in Uganda. Uh, Dr. Samuel Okware is a, a personal colleague. We've been uh, uh, working together for decades. Uh, when I was Director General in the Ministry of Health, he was the Commissioner for Community Health. From the very first big outbreak of Ebola Sudan in Uganda in the year 2000, he was the uh, chair of the National Task Force. And uh, from then on, he developed interest in this topic. He has uh, uh, actually got his PhD on Ebola. He has uh, 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 written several books uh, on this topic. And uh, he is also currently still working in the Ministry of Health as the Director General of the National Health Research Organization. So we have an excellent uh, speaker to tell us what happened with Ebola in the past in Uganda. What lessons do we uh, pick from that? And uh, how can we use them today? Uh, so uh, uh, Sam, please take the floor. Can you allow me to share? Please. Uh, yeah, you are the one sharing. Um, and just minimize it and then I don't I don't see yeah. okay let me just I would like to I would like to thank uh, uh, you for inviting me to share with you our experiences over the last 20 years and secondly I think I would like to thank uh, the incident manager Henry you've done a fantastic job you made us all proud no new case very low fertility I mean, for not very low case fatality and also almost no death as of today. So that is really great. Um, and I think all the other cases have really been managed promptly and secured. Uh, this, which is very, very important in managing this outbreak. I had a special opportunity together with the chairperson, with Professor Maswa, to have led uh, the uh, containment of four outbreaks, four or five outbreaks uh, since the year 2000. We also had two Marburg outbreaks, which are very similar. But uh, I thought perhaps today I should be able to share with you uh, uh, their experiences, uh, capacity, lessons learned, and also I'd like to share with you uh, some of our best, the, the best examples, the best, the, the best outcome, and also the worst outcomes, so that we can be able to see, take advantage of what the community can actually do. Um, Chair, I think, I think from the very beginning, I think let me just say, I always keep this picture, this is river Ebola. To the right of that, the north of that is Southern Sudan, and to the east, west of that is the RSC. Uh, there was a major outbreak here in the 1976, and in, the, in, the, in, in, in Sudan, in Zara, there was a, another out, similar outbreak in 1976. So the Sudanese outbreak was a uh, result of the uh, Sudan Ebola virus, and I think that's really what migrated down to Northern Uganda. Uh, globally, I think in Africa, we've had 28 outbreaks, and most of which are in Central Africa. We used to be number one, but we were overtaken by the outbreak in West Africa, which had 30,000 patients, 30,000 cases, uh, 10,000 deaths, and uh, of whom I think 800 were medical personnel. Let us just describe um, a little bit about um, our Ebola cases by year since 2000. Uh, what is interesting about these cases is that they have been coming with increasing frequency. Secondly, they have been coming in areas where there are forests, and they have been coming during the rainy season, uh, the fruit season, and when people are clearing forests for agriculture. And um, that has been very consistent, which is why most of these cases have actually been in Western Uganda, uh, Western and Central Uganda. We had a serious Ebola outbreak in 2000, uh, which again, like this particular one, people ran away from there to Gulu, to Masindi, but again, it was quickly controlled. Um, 2007, we had the Bundi Buju outbreak, which is not related to this one. And in Ruero, I think we had the best example of an outbreak. One case, one fatality, it stopped, and there was no uh, uh, thanks to community mobilization. And in the Kibale district, also we had uh, a few out outbreaks uh, following years. And in Ruero, again, we had seven cases. And uh, that's what happened. And today, now we have this Mubende outbreak, which is coming. This is just a graphic uh, example, which I told you. 
Uh, many of the uh, many of the areas, uh, most of these areas, the first uh, 2000 that was in Zulu, they ran down to uh, Masi here down to Barara and Masindi, but they were all contained very quickly. And as you can see, all these cases have actually been in, in those areas. Now, where do these outbreaks really come from? We did, did try to do some studies here. We found there were some uh, uh, antibodies in pigs, in, sorry, in uh, uh, in bats. There are antibodies, I think, in some uh, some uh, uh, primates in the, in, in Luero, but then we are not absolutely sure. But we feel that perhaps the bats, for the time being, from the results that we got from Ibanda at one time feel the bats are a major reservoir because all these other animals are victims. All these animals are victims, have been episodic in all these animals, uh, the chimpanzees, the stool, the ducas, and so on. Now, when this, uh, we, we feel that what normally, uh, the, the way the index case usually goes out to hunt or to organize his gardens and so on, they may eat uh, half-eaten uh, infected fruits. They get infected, they come home, then from there you get close contact with, uh, with the family, and the disease continues uh, from that side. Uh, some, some of the people actually are <clears throat> hunters, they get the, they consume infected meat, and that is a problem. And of course, once the disease is in the home or in a hospital setting, everything else, all the formites are infectious. But what was very interesting, I think, in Guru, was that uh, there were a lot of people who were also positive, but asymptomatic, and they had no, they had no, no symptoms completely. So we are wondering whether this was cross-reacting uh, antibodies or whether it was just a, a normal thing and that they were managing. And uh, also we found that, um, I think uh, the studies in West Africa recently, they really showed that there was a endogenous spread. Semen, for instance, after three months, 100% of the semen are infected. And uh, after six months, 62% and so on and so on. Breast milk, and also uh, other protected parts, neurologically protected parts in the body also can harbor the virus. So we are wondering whether a virus, a virus persistent derived transmission is possible. Uh, not really, the, possibly with, 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 uh, with the, uh, the West, uh, with, with the uh, Zaire type of Ebola, but not yet here. But here also we found that um, there, were, there were some cross-reacting antibodies with the pig and some dogs were also infected. Uh, when, uh, when, when, we, when we, we try to test them. And let us briefly see the clinical symptoms, clinical status of some of, this, uh, uh, of these patients. Because the main thing really is clinical case definition. We are relying on fever, we are relying on bleeding. But we are very surprised that many of the patients, especially in Iguru, many of the patients in Iguru and subsequent uh, outbreaks, fever was only about in 85% of them. The rest of the people just came in innocently. Sometimes they come through the general wards and they are picked, they are picked usually from the uh, general wards after they have already infected other people. We also happened to see that there was no infection before fever. And there was always an epi link. And burials were a very important part of the epi link. Um, um, I think cadavers in particular, uh, which is why some of the women in, uh, there were the majority in Iguru, Cadavers, as they were being prepared for burial, were a major factor in the transmission. So the risk factors, like <clears throat> risk factors, basically, like what I just, what we discovered at that time was complacency. People thought that if you are not in the isolation ward, you are safe. If, if most of the infections came from the general wards, and also the support staff felt that because they were not inside the wards, therefore they were protected. This is this was a fallacy because many of them got down. Now, the case definition, again, we had some problems with, because while it was very sensitive, the positive predictive value was very, very low. And so was the case with the, with the lab. So as you can see here, this is, a, this is very similar to what we are having now. There was, a, there was a, those peaks, as you can see, they correspond to the infection period, and, um, uh, which was about 12 days uh, on average. Seven was, seven was, the, uh, was, the, was, was the average. But, um, but, uh, but up to 22, uh, 21 days, it hasn't quite changed. I wanted to just look at the age distribution of the cases in Google, because this was the largest, uh, largest group of patients. Here you can see that the majority, almost 17 times more women were affected as the years go by, basically because they were responsible for burial. Now, how did we respond? 
as a country with, uh, with all these four epidemics. I think the most important thing was that community engagement, the people were very, very, uh, the people were, the communities were most, most involved in this. Community engagement, that's the first line of, line of defense. People to be restricted, people to be kept in one group and not move. Leadership, one joint plan. Uh, why did we think that communities are important? Because we felt, I think, in fact, Professor, uh, Professor Massa was always talking about this. Health is made at home and only repaired in a, in a health facility. So we felt that by creating good health uh, communities that involve their families and so on, uh, can contribute a lot for the community, uh, community uh, empowerment and also well-being. So by empowering communities, we are engaging them and so that they can take ownership and also make sure that fear is reduced in the community. So the communities were responsible for making sure this, uh, they're identifying, isolating, and informing the public. And here they're using very basic tools, community-based surveillance, contact tracing. Each had a register, home-based care. There was nothing very complicated they had. And they were responsible for making sure that in a, a community, say a village of 500 households, which is average, they are responsible to make sure that everybody who's sick stays at his home, nobody leaves the village, and everybody is actually surveilled, and also they are linking up with the district uh, district district uh, uh, task force. So they also had important info, informant task force, basically having a register. They had existing structures from the previous outbreaks, and also they had a massive human resource. Human resource, their goodwill is more than money. So it's important that they, they are brought on board to help us with this. Now the issue of money of facilitation has come up many times. Uh, but here, really, basically, we need very moderate, very moderate incentives. A bag, uh, a book, a small uh, calculator, that type of thing is what kept everybody on board. And of course, the oral library supported the skills and really. This is the community-based, uh, community-based, uh, the engine of, of the control. You have at the community level 500 households. There are two people who are picked here. The scout, they go around the village and they're communicating with the district surveillance office and the response of burials, ambulance team, collecting data in the evening, and then transferring some of the patients, finding the hospital, and making sure that they're in charge. In other words, you have 10,000 villages, there are 10,000 teams that are in charge of the program. Let us just look at some of our frustrations. The frustration basically is the delay. This one, first thing here, the delay. On average, all these outbreaks which we had, there was a two-week and a three-week delay in, uh, in 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 getting the in getting the in getting to know the epidemic. And um, and uh, you can see, say, in the case of Duero, once you get the epidemic quickly, and you always get sure that this can be contained very very quickly. Where there was a long delay, and also uh, out, 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 uh, the outcomes were not so good. There was also another frustration. The case definition I said told you was is quite uh, sensitive, but very low positive, uh, low positive predictive value. Only 50% of those who had been identified by mobile team were re-validated by supervisor as cases. But this is not bad. Uh, and I think what I think uh, was most frustrating was the issue of the laboratory tests. As you can see here, the positive predictive value was as low as 20, 21%, 39%, and so on and so forth. But let us just share the best outcomes that we had. There also was a case of uh, an outbreak in, 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 in Duero here. I think it would have been one of the best in the world where you get only one, one fatality. There was a girl who came on the on 1st of May on that date. Two days later, they were admitted with what looked like, a, what looked like an abortion. Uh, she was kept uh, there for two days, tested positive. A community-based engagement was, uh, was imposed on the people no more cases were, were, dis were, were, were reported and the epidemic disappeared immediately, thanks to the community. There was another area where I think community containment was very, very helpful. Here, there was two patients who escaped from Guru. They went to Masindi from Lachor Hospital. They went to Masindi here. Now the community just put around quarantine around that village. So only those people in that uh, community, in this community here, are the ones who died. Otherwise, the rest of the one million or so people in the district were not affected. So this community engagement and restriction is the first line of defense. 
sorry. Uh, sorry, something has happened. No, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, that's all. So, at the end of the day, what message do we really have on here? Are you are getting me? Yes. Yes. So, at the end of the day, what message have we really learned from, from this? I think the main lesson, lesson to learn here is that is that is that one uh, early detection and early action are the early winner. We've known of the community engagement is very important. Quarantine is the first line of line of defense. The risks are very obvious. The forest, rainy season, the fruit season, all the planting season are very important. And also the people who go to the maternity with the conditions not necessarily related to HIV, with this condition. Simple things like menses, simple things like ab 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 abortions and so on. All those must be the highly suspicious. And also we must know that the doctors themselves, because we are moonlighting, we are going from clinic A to clinic B, clinic C, we have the real difficulties. Uh, uh, sometimes trying to control ourselves, we become propagators of the infection. Now the, 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 the issues of maldiagnosis and so on, I think, um, uh, uh my that my, my, my and so on i think is very important because here we have so many conditions a third of the patients in the hospitals opds and malaria all is fever and also we have these other viruses bunya viruses uh, yellow fever and so on it can also confuse the picture so ladies and gentlemen i think um the message i'm actually telling you is that um they, they the other problem is a false sense of security People thinking that because they are not in the general world, they are not in the isolation world, they are therefore uh, protected. That's not correct. And finally, really, the question is that uh, the message I want to inform, uh, give you is that community engagement gives the holistic approach, makes community surveillance much easier, and is the center of gravity of the containment measures. Ladies and gentlemen, not all of the 100% perfect. But the Minister of Health, working along its partners and the community, contain the outbreaks, sometimes with delays, but once uh, promptly and effectively. Over. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Kware, for uh, giving us that very detailed presentation of the past outbreaks and your analysis of uh, uh, various issues, presentation, epidemiology. Uh, the response and the, the lessons. Uh, one of the big things you said, according to me, from what I've heard, is increasing frequency. That is what you have observed in Uganda. And it's probably the case in other countries too. We will hear from uh, uh, our a friend from the DRC. Uh, but it is anticipated that with climate change, uh, infectious diseases, outbreaks are likely to increase. So let's take note of that. The other point which I, I, I take from you uh, is uh, the, 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 the role of the community in the response in early detection, in quarantine management, and in uh, 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 being uh, uh, suspicious. And also we, the health workers, being awake to this uh, disease and not being the, the spreaders or becoming victims. So uh, we'll come back to discuss all this in a moment. And um, I would now like to hand over to uh, our colleague, uh, John Machega, uh, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Prof. Mastra. Thank you, Prof. Masra, and thank you, uh, Sam, for that uh, uh, excellent talk. Could you stop sharing your screen, uh, Sam? Okay, great. Uh, so let me, it, it, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jean-Jacques Muyembe uh, from DRC. Uh, uh, Jean-Jacques may not need introduction for many of you, uh, but let me, just for those who don't know him, uh, Jean-Jacques Muyembe is professor of virology at University of Kinshasa, and he also director, co-founder of the National Institute of Biomedical Research uh, in Kinshasa. 
he was the co-discoverer of the Ebola virus uh, in 1976 in the Yambuku village in the province of Equator in DRC. Uh, he received many prizes uh, for his work on Ebola, uh, from the Hidego Prize in Japan to the Marier Prize, uh, prestigious Marier Prize in France. Um, he is the principal investigator of the PALM-001, which uh, was the first uh, clinical trial published in New England Journal uh, of uh, therapeutics for uh, Ebola. Um, he also uh, was instrumental uh, for the PALM-007 that just took over in DRC uh, to evaluate therapeutics for monkeypox. Uh, Jean-Jacques Muyembe, uh, uh, he, he going to talk about uh, what the lesson they learned in DRC uh, about uh, uh, the based on the recent uh, the last outbreak, but also trying to to see some uh, some, some way of uh, uh, giving us some insights how the strain in DRC uh, as are different from the the strain uh, in Uganda and uh, what uh, on both sides uh, he can share with us as a kind of a wisdom. Uh, in terms of uh, either prevention on therapeutics or vaccine uh, and uh, and some aspect of research. Jean-Jacques, uh, it's up to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for this uh, nice presentation or introduction. So I, I always uh, talk about the uh, past Ebola uh, Zaire outbreaks in uh, DRC. So um, the first outbreak occurred in 1976 uh, in Yambuku. At that time, we call the mysterious disease because this disease uh, uh, caused a lot of uh, deaths uh, in, uh, in Yambuku. It was in September. And um, the, uh, the, 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 the Minister of Health was alerted on 21 September. Uh, at that time, uh, the Minister of Health uh, 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 thought that it was a typhoid fever or yellow fever. Uh, so I was sent to the um, epicenter of the outbreak. So I was the first scientist to arrive there. Uh, it was on 22, uh, 22 23 September. Uh, and, uh, and the international uh, team came on 18 uh, October. Uh, okay, at that time, the, the main mode of transmission was the reuse of syringes and person-to-person -person, uh, uh, transmission, mainly during the traditional uh, funerals. Uh, in total, uh, we had uh, 318 uh, uh, cases of uh, this mysterious disease, and um, uh, 280 of them died, uh, a case fatality rate of 88. Uh, and the most, the most, uh, okay, uh, some of the, the victims were the five Belgian missionaries, who died of uh, uh, this disease in 1976. And uh, so the, 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 the objective of uh, my mission there was to explore the cause of this uh, mysterious disease. So um, as a microbiologist, I collected uh, uh, blood samples for serology for a serology without test, and also five blood culture uh, to look for uh, typhoid. And also because of suspected suspicion of uh, yellow fever, we collected three post-mortem liver samples uh, on 24 September. Uh, all these, uh, uh, these, uh, these, uh, what I did uh, at that time, we have no, no, no protecting equipment. So um, my, my fingers were 
uh, soil with uh, a blood of uh, patients. So that uh, at that time, I, as a microbiologist, I washed my, uh, my hands with uh, water and, uh, and, and, and soap. I think this, is, this was very important. Uh, uh, and uh, if I, 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 am, I, am, I am still alive now, it is because of this, uh, uh, of the hygiene of hands, uh, what I did at that time. Uh, so um, all these samples were processed on my lab in, um, at the University of Kinshasa. Uh, this was a simple lab uh, with uh, wooden benches covered with formica, irregular running water, reusable glassware, and mouth pipetting was the rule at that time. So as I said, we have no gloves, we have no PPA. And uh, so, um, and also I, um, so I shot, I shot in my stay in, uh, in Yambuku and, and uh, went back to um, uh, Kinshasa. And um, I transferred one of, one of the, the norms, it is uh, one of the, the, the nurse, the, it was this, the, the Belgian uh, sister who was, who developed fever in my, when I was, uh, during my stay there. So um, I traveled with her to uh, Kinshasa uh, to, um, to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, looking for a, a best uh, uh, diagnostic. Uh, so um, from uh, the blood of this, uh, uh, this uh, sister, uh, the, 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 the virus was isolated at the ITM Institute of Tropical Medicine uh, in Antwerp and uh, further uh, characterized by, uh, uh, by CDC as being a new virus uh, called uh, Ebola virus. So um, Ebola virus was not a new uh, deadly disease, but without specific treatment. Since its discovery in 1976, for several decades, Ebola virus disease, despite its high case mortality rate, remained as a neglected orphan disease without vaccine or specific treatment. Uh, both Ebola Zaire and Ebola Bundibudio uh, are circulating in DRC. Uh, for the treatment, only supporting care was provided. Um, but uh, in, 19, in 1995, we had uh, another big outbreak um, uh, in Kipwit, and this outbreak was, was uh, uh, at the beginning, was a nosocomial inf infection. Uh, a lab technician was uh, uh, operated in Kipwit, and uh, after this operation, um, uh, many, many, um, uh, many, many doctors and uh, anesthesiologists and um, nurses were contaminated. Uh, for example, uh, the anesthesiologist uh, uh, Mubiala contaminated uh, three uh, doctors. Uh, one of them uh, died, and uh, the nurse who was uh, also a sister. Uh, from Italian uh, uh, congregation, uh, in fact, also um, a lot of uh, uh, other uh, sisters in the COVID. Uh, so this is, this was the the beginning of a, of a very big uh, 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 outbreak with three hundred seventeen cases and two hundred fifty deaths. Uh, case fatality rate of 78%. So, um, Kikwit outbreak emerged 19 years after the original Yambuku outbreak in 1976. It was the first urban epidemic with the risk of spreading to the two closest capital in the world, Kinshasa and Brazzaville. The first ever implementation of a package of public health intervention, including case management, surveillance, contact tracing, 
safe and dignified burial, social mobilization for community engagement, infection prevention and control were established at that, uh, at that outbreak. And also, uh, we uh, treated eight Ebola patients with blood from uh, uh, Ebola survivor. So um, this, uh, this was the first time to have uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these kind of uh, experiment, experiment, experiment uh, excuse me, experiment. So um, eight patients, Ebola patients, were treated with the transfusion, with blood transfusion of Ebola survivors. And seven of them survived. And this, uh, this, uh, uh, the result of this experiment was published in the Journal of Infectious Disease. And we concluded that uh, Ebola antibodies were protective. But, but uh, this experiment remained as a merry anecdote for a long time because uh, it was an observational study without a control arm because uh, this experiment occurred at the queue of the outbreak. Maybe the virus has lost its virulence because the, the small sample size of our study only on eight patients and also because the failure of a perimmune serum in macaque in the lab, uh, a researcher from uh, NIH uh, showed that uh, macaque are not protected with a perimmune serum uh, of, uh, from Ebola. And finally, the evaluation of convalescent plasma for Ebola virus in Guinea was not associated with a significant improvement in survival. It is why the blood from Ebola survivor was not used in subsequent epidemics uh, of uh, Ebola virus in Africa for many decades. But I continue to, uh, to think that uh, Ebola antibodies were protected. It is why we were in contact with, uh, with uh, researchers from uh, NIH in the United States, uh, Dr. Abraham, Dr. Brown, Graham and uh, uh, Bar Bar Barney Graham and Dr. Nancy Sullivan. So um, we uh, decided to continue to work on the, the blood of, uh, of uh, survivors of Ebola. And one of them, uh, uh, was uh, Mr. Mobiala, who developed severe Ebola virus disease uh, at that time with fever, headache, uh, arthralgia, bloody diarrhea, and so on, and was hospitalized for two weeks, followed by uh, six months of providing inpatient care by uh, to patients admitted with Ebola virus infection. So uh, for me, this guy was, was, ex, uh, was uh, exposed many times to, to the virus. So um, he must have developed uh, antibodies to uh, Ebola. Uh, indeed, uh, indeed uh, 11 years after the, the, the the infection, Mubiala had, uh, still had antibodies to, uh, to Ebola. And so um, his blood was collected and um, the antibody gene were, were, were uh, cloned uh, to produce monoclonal uh, antibodies. And one of these monoclonal antibodies we call uh, uh, MAP114 was uh, effective to neutralize uh, Ebola virus. 
So the first, uh, the, the phase one study was conducted in the uh, United States. And at that time, we, we have also um, outbreaks of uh, uh, Ebola uh, in DRC. So uh, we think that it was uh, the opportunity to, to, uh, to use these uh, monoclonal uh, antibodies uh, MAP114. So um, these, uh, these uh, antibodies was used uh, in two protocols. It is uh, the MERI protocol and uh, RCT protocol under the umbrella of uh, WHO. Um, I will not develop how, how we did this uh, experimentation, um, but it was a very, very, a very good uh, consortium between uh, uh, my, instit my institute, INRB, NIH, and other uh, uh, NGOs uh, uh, involved in the in the Ebola response in, uh, in, in, in DRC. Uh, so um, in summary, we isolated monoclonal antibodies that neutralize Ebola virus. Uh, that was use of monotherapy with MAP114. So this MAP114 protects macaque when given as late as five days after challenge. And we show that administration of MAP114 is safe and were tolerated at 50 microgram uh, by uh, microgram by uh, kilo. And the treatment with a single human map suggested that a simplified therapeutic strategy for human Ebola infection may be possible. So um, in, uh, in 2018, uh, to, yeah, uh, no, yeah. To 2018, yes, Ebola hit the eastern of the DRC for the first time. It is North Kivu and Ituri provinces were affected. It was the, lar the largest Ebola virus outbreak in DRC. And however, what declared by WHO, this outbreak was declared by WHO as a public health emergency of international concern. But the containment of this outbreak was very challenging due to active armed conflict and low adherence of the population to the outbreak control measures. So this outbreak uh, was for us uh, an opportunity to use technological innovation and to conduct clinical trial for vaccine therapeutics and diagnosis. Okay, so uh, in 2018, we had two simultaneous Ebola outbreaks in DRC. One in Bikoro, in the equatorial region, as you can see there on the left, and the other one uh, in, uh, in Beni, it is the North Kivu uh, uh, province. Though, so the Biporo province, the Poro uh, outbreak um, was, uh, the outbreak started on April the 3rd, and the outbreak was confirmed by PCR on May 7th, and officially declared on May 8th by the Minister of Health and on 25 uh, July, the outbreak was declared over. But meantime, uh, in Beni, in North Kivu, another outbreak was uh, suspected in May because of the community deaths. And uh, this outbreak was uh, confirmed by PCR on July. Uh, 31, and the hardware was declared on uh, on August the 1st. Uh, but uh, that, at that time, we, we thought that uh, it was the same virus. So uh, the virus came from uh, Bikoro 
to uh, Benin. But um, we have no feasible roads between uh, these two uh, cities, uh, Bikoro and, um, and Benin. So we process um, by, uh, by PCR. No, no um, we, we sequenced the two uh, virus, the virus from Bikoro and the virus from uh, Mangina Beni. And it was shown that, um, that uh, we have two independent outbreaks during the same period. So the virus from uh, uh, Beni is uh, different from the virus from uh, uh, Bikoro. So we have two, two independent outbreaks during the same uh, period. So for this, uh, uh, in DRC, uh, we use uh, traditional uh, approaches to control Ebola outbreaks. Uh, from 1976 to 2018 outbreaks, we use simple public health control measures. I mean, patient isolation, contact tracing, safe burials, uh, healthcare workers training, and uh, community engagement uh, being the cornerstone. All outbreaks were contained in three or four months with less than uh, 400 cases. But this strategy did not work uh, with the 2018-2019 two, the Ebola outbreak that occurred in uh, North Kivu. So uh, it was important to use innovative approaches. And uh, innovative approaches, uh, we have the objective to vaccine. So these innovative approaches consist of, uh, of vaccine to limit the expansion of the outbreak, the investigation of therapeutics to limit the number of uh, deaths, and uh, labor laboratory support for surveillance, contact tracing by sequencing, vaccination, and therapeutics. So um, the pool for the vaccination, uh, we had two vaccines, two types of vaccine. Um, the first one is uh, the RVSV, the above ZP. It is the vaccine from um, uh, Merck, from Merck. And uh, this, vaccine, this vaccine was, was uh, used under expanded access, we call also Mary, for compassionate use. And, uh, and, and uh, the population targeted is the, the contact, of, uh, contact of positive case, healthcare workers and frontline front line workers. Um, so this, uh, this vaccine, RVSV, was uh, for, uh, only for um, uh, ring vaccination around the case. Another vaccine we tested was, uh, was uh, the AD26, is above MVA, BN Philo in Goma. This is for the general population. And the protocol used for uh, the, this investigation therapeutics were MERI protocol. It is the monitor emergency use of an registered experimental intervention um, under the WHO um, uh, umbrella. And uh, we have a D D DMC, uh, uh, to protect the safety and well-being of the patient under study. And the second protocol was the, the randomized clinical trial. Uh, and for that also we have uh, DCMB to protect the safety and well-being of the patient enrolled in the study and protect the integrity of the data. Uh, for these two uh, uh, protocol, we need uh, the authorization of the national regulatory uh, national regulatory authorities, um, the ethics uh, committee, 
and also we administer the informed consent. So the um, the randomized clinical trial uh, was conducted under the protocol called uh, Palm Palm, which is Pamonja Lutulinde uh, Pamonja Tulinde Maisha. Um, let us protect, let us save life in Swahili. And uh, the primary objective of this uh, RCT was the comparison of, of 22, 28 days mortality relative to the control arm, uh, as I will show later, uh, that it is ZIMAP. And the secondary objective was an evaluation of the comparative safety and tolerability of the four investigational therapeutics. And the study is monitored by an independent data and safety monitor board, as I said. Okay, so this is uh, the, the four molecule we use. We have Zimap. It is a cocktail of chimeric uh, human murine monoclonal antibodies. Uh, all these uh, products are effective only for Ebola Zaire, uh, the strain Ebola Zaire, not Ebola Sudan. Uh, the second one was uh, Regeneron. Uh, this is a cocktail of free human monoclonal antibodies. And uh, so the third was uh, MAP114, that a single human monoclonal antibodies. It is our molecule. And the uh, redem severe, it is to protect product uh, with, a blow, uh, with a broad spectrum antiviral. Okay, so this is the, the, the first treated patients the two boy, two girls you see there, which um, they were treated with the MAP114, you know, in our people. So uh, for them, I am like a, a god <laughs> because, uh, because they were severely ill when we arrived there. So um, the, 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 another challenge we have is to develop local diagnosis capacity. Um, uh, between 1976 and 2007, our samples were collected locally and sent to CDC or to, um, to uh, CDC or to NICD in South Africa or to SIRMF, uh, it is a center for uh, medical research in France and in, in Gabon. So um, we have to wait one or two weeks to receive the results. It was not easy to, to, uh, to take care of patients with these kinds of um, diagnosis. Uh, so uh, we tried to, to develop and we succeeded in the transfer of, of uh, diagnostic uh, technology. Uh, we, in 2018, we are able to, um, to uh, process by uh, uh, PCR, mm, RT PCR, uh, QRT PCR, and also we use the platform and gene expert, uh, gene expert to um, to detect uh, the the NP NP gene and GP uh, of Ebola Ebola virus, and we are also uh, capable to uh, to perform our sequencing, full sequence uh, full. Uh, full genome of the Ebola virus. We use uh, two platform, uh, MyInon, uh, uh, Oxford Nanopore Technology, and uh, MySec, uh, Illumina uh, Technology. And also we were able to, um, to establish um, uh, laboratories uh, in the field at different epicenters of the outbreak in DRC. Uh, for example, in Beni, in Butembo, and in Katwa, uh, and, and, and so on. So these kinds of uh, uh, equipment we have 
uh, even even sequencing, we conduct sequencing uh, in the field uh, in uh, in uh, in Takra. Uh, so in conclusion, um, and uh, lesson learned, once Ebola disease, once Ebola disease had no treatment or vaccine, only supportive care were provided to patients. Today, Ebola virus is preventable thanks to the to, thanks to two WHO approved vaccine. Uh, I mean, Merck RVSV's above ZP vaccine. It is a single dose vaccine for ring vaccination during an Ebola outbreak. The second vaccine is Johnson and Johnson. Uh, this is AD26 is above MVA beans filo vaccine. That is a double dose vaccine to implement to implement preventive vaccination for people at risk in association or not with an Ebola outbreak. Today, Ebola virus is also curable thanks to the two FDA approved antibodies based treatment. It is Regeneron, a single intravenous dose, uh, dose, and also MAP114, a single intravenous dose with case fatality of uh, 35%. Ebanga, the dream of my life, is now a reality thanks to the commitment of Congolese scientists the cooperation with NIS US and the contribution of Congolese patient and survivor. And uh, scientific rigorous and ethical sound clinical research can be conducted during an outbreak and provide data to help inform the outbreak response. We learn from Palm study that patient arriving late during the course of the disease with very low value of CT are at great risk of dying. Effort is needed to develop new therapeutics to improve survival and to complete uh, clear the virus from survival. We must be concerned about the sexual transmission of Ebola virus by uh, Ebola survivors. And the virus reservoir needs also to be addressed to have a clear understanding of the dynamic or dynamics of the transmission. And so um, I want to acknowledge uh, to all our partners uh, everywhere in the world. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Muyembe. Uh, uh, that really was outstanding talk, and uh, so I think we we have really uh, uh, food for thought, question, comment, and uh, I'm gonna really pass uh, back uh, the mic uh, to my co-moderator. Um, uh, to we can go back and forth. Uh, maybe uh, Francis, you want uh, to have quick comment overall. Well, it is uh, absolutely um, fascinating to listen to the presentations, uh, including the last one from uh, Professor Muyembe. Uh, we uh, have a future, and there are still major unknowns, but it is up to us, as he said, thanks to partners and the scientists and the patients. Uh, we have very little time uh, left for uh, our audience to uh, interact with us, but we should give them time. Or oh, are we able to extend the meeting by another 15 minutes, for example? Is that possible? So I, uh, Clara, uh, uh, are we okay if we go five minutes over? So we, we still have 10 minutes, but it's okay to go fifth, uh, to have 15 minutes. Please 15 minutes. Okay, good. Okay, uh, okay, One, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, 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 do we have uh, uh, reactions, questions, hands up? I don't see any, but uh, uh, please. So uh, is that I, I have, I have, I, I did monitor the chat. There is no uh, 
specific question from the chat, but anyone who wants to ask a question can uh, either just jump in and ask the question or comment. Yeah, while, while we are waiting, uh, 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 John, just monitor. While we are waiting, I, I, I would like to uh, just underline that the, uh, uh, Professor Muyembe said two things. There is a virus circulating in the region. And then these two outbreaks of Bikoro and Beni happening independently. My uh, understanding and view uh, about this disease in Uganda also here is that it's endemic and we don't know the reservoir. And we should not be surprised to see it crop up at any time, anywhere. And we should therefore uh, be much better prepared for it. So that's one major point that uh, I take forward. Uh, and the other one is um, uh, how we can improve on the therapeutics there, the vaccines and the therapeutics, it's particularly for health workers to start with, and then uh, vulnerable populations when uh, we get hit by an infection. But these new tools, we need to work hard on them and uh, develop them. And can, can we do this here in Africa ourselves? We were talking about the, the COVID vaccine uh, being available to other people and not to us. Is there a way our political leaders can work with the scientists to develop these vaccines? There is a hand up, Naoko Shindo. Uh, please uh, 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 unmute and take the floor. Thank you very much. Introduce yourself as you start. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, this is Nikki Shindo uh, from WHO, and I thank the organizers and then also uh, Professor David Heyman to extend um, the information about this wonderful webinar uh, to WHO. Um, I would like to ask some questions to Henry. Hi, Henry, and, and uh, congratulations to your leadership and successful Thank control you. so far. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, so happy to see you on the screen. Um, so my first question is about um, the cluster. And then this 26-year-old uh, um, young um, gentleman who seems to be um, uh, to have become epiphosi for this um, cluster. Um, he just came for Orchitis and, and got um, treated um, for that disease. Um, I was wondering if he was the, um, the index of, of this cluster or he just happened to be infected in this healthcare facility. And then um, it was striking that um, this amplifying um, super spreading event um, still took place in Uganda in a house facility that we have tried so hard to implement in infection prevention measures and, and training for the healthcare workers. Um, um, that's one sad thing, but um, the subsequent infection um, starting from case number 90, um, would you be able to give us some insight into how these infection to subsequent five to six cases um, uh, took place, um, the mode of the transmission, if possible, and they all ended up with very mild cases. Um, are they just friends or happen to, to be a work um, colleague or um, something else? Um, and then uh, if possible also, um, can you, Henry, perhaps describe about clinical feature of this outbreak um, is gastrointestinal symptom like a vomiting and diarrhea prominent or typical febrile, very severe multi-organ failure as the major uh, clinical feature. Over to you. Okay, Henry, uh, I think she's asking you about that patient who came from, was it Mubende or and one district, Kampala, and so on. Please uh, uh, provide your response, Henry. Uh, uh, th <clears throat> thanks, Nikki. Uh, great <laughs> seeing you again.
Uh, again, here, uh, much, much appreciated, Nikke, and uh, thank you so much for the questions. One, bronchitis and ended up in a facility. The processes in these private facilities, it was a much small but very busy facility. And actually, that's another risk factor in, a, in an outbreak. Uh, or busy, small, and again, even the application of IPC measures was hugely limited. The, the variation between the IPC standards between private and public is actually enormous, uh, where public facilities, the, the IPC measures are actually much higher, but in private facilities, it's much, much lower. And we see this individual getting exposed in a facility where there was another patient immediately after that. And then subsequent transmission to his friends, the transmission to the subsequent cases in the ninth series and the early 100 series was basically caring for him. As I said, he was a young, popular individual in town. He continued going by his life, even when he was ill. He attended a football match in a small video cinema where he collapsed and they hoped him. Uh, later on, again, as I will speak later, is, uh, is that uh, what we see in this outbreak is consistently the GI symptoms, obviously, uh, a, 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 a reality, most especially for patients who, do, who have poor clinical outcomes. But the consistent finding that we see is epigastric pain nearly all patients present with the epigastric pain. Again, as I said, we are kind of missing this epigastric pain because the case investigation form does not capture epigastric pain. It only says abdominal pain. We are, we are working on revising that. And I think uh, you will be, we'll be glad if you can contribute to this, that the, the epigastric pain is really very consistent. And what I didn't talk about to you was, uh, a, a mistake made before the outbreak was made when a, a group of surgeons went ahead and operated on a on an Ebola patient who got a cardiac arrest on the table and he died and they came to resuscitate. Six of them got infected. We lost two of them. We lost two of them, but the others survived. So again, the GI symptoms, the diverse picture, the diarrhea, vomiting, uh, abdominal pain <clears throat> are actually very evident. But again, what we see in this current outbreak are the convulsions. Again, this with again when you look and much of this data is lost because again, convulsions are not part of the traditional case investigation form, which again is missed. So there is a variation. Again, what we see more is that the hemorrhagic manifestation, as we know, come late. But again, in this circumstance, we see much less hemorrhagic manifestations as we see in Ebola Zaire. Uh, thank you so much. Very good. Nahoko, is that good yeah, for you? Yeah, maybe uh, just to add that in the yes, previous, thank you very much. Uh, four outbreaks which we had uh, in, in Uganda, uh, skin rash was very, very low, between 5 and 10%, and that was very consistent. And also the gastrointestinal uh, uh, features were very, very low, so about 30%. Uh, and many people just came in and dropped dead um, in, some, in some instances. So really, uh, that is the position. Now, with regards to index case, it is almost impossible. All the outbreaks we've had here, four or five of them, we've never been in a position to know who the index case is because they, have all, they always die and pick them up because pick the disease because there's a cluster. So nobody really knows where who the index case is, but in most cases, it's the, it's the location only, which guides us and where we can suspect it could be this and that. But otherwise, index cases, it has never been possible to get them 100%. Over. Except the one in the, the one, the, the one and only in Luero. Yes, yes, yes. Well, just one. Only that one we suspect. But the, that one, uh, we thought so. She was a student, and uh, in, the, in that school there were bats uh, in the roof of the of the school. So we suspected that it was the bats. Actually, some some samples were taken, and there was some evidence that there was some uh, IgG uh, antibodies uh, to Ebola. So that's the only one we suspect uh, could have been the primary case. Over.
Okay, uh, John, you are on this app. Yes, uh, just uh, to Harry uh, or Sam. Um, so uh, I, I would really want to commend uh, the Uganda team for really, you know, uh, controlling the those the the, uh, the current outbreak. Uh, my question was: uh, Is there was uh, more than traditional measure for that control? I understood that uh, Ebola Sudan is, you know, the strain uh, is not uh, the vaccine used in DRC or therapeutic may not be applicable. Is any uh, therapeutic trial that has been planned or did uh, start uh, specific for the Sudan strain? Uh, Henry, maybe you can tell us what efforts you have made here to do some studies and research around this yeah, yeah. current outbreak. No, thanks, Prof. Uh, I, I, yes. Uh, <clears throat> We, we are still re largely relying on the traditional measures and of course with the modification of the others uh, basically on the control we don't have the vaccine yet the vaccine trial should have started a couple of weeks but of course uh, several regulatory processes have delayed a little bit but everything is ready to start the trial uh, for a for Sudan Ebola virus using three the th one of the three molecules one after the other but as it turns out now, we are increasingly seeing fewer and fewer cases to do the trial. But what we have used here is that we use monoclonal antibodies. We have used MBP MBP one three four on a few patients. The outcomes actually promising, most especially in the, if given early in the illness. But if given late in the illness, the outcomes actually. Uh, not, not impressive. Uh, so again, we we have largely relied on uh, on the traditional measures. And uh, Ali K, as I said, for the Kampala cluster, uh, when we got them, is basically early rehydration mm. and uh, and early rehydration and follow up. Of course, now it's much better than it was a couple of years ago, uh, 2007 when it began and part of when we were in West Africa, that uh, we have some degree of patient monitoring. May not be sufficient, but we have some degree of patient monitoring. And I think this speaks to, to some of the good outcomes we are having. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Anyone else with a question, a comment? Um, a, a field laboratories, what is the capability of the field laboratories? How helpful are they? I know when we had the, uh, the, the big Ebola in Uganda in Gulu, it made a big revolution when uh, I think it was CDC who brought uh, uh, field labs uh, for us. What improvements have taken place with these uh, field labs? Do you want me to start, Prof? Uh, yes, and also Professor Muyembe, if you can comment on that. I'll start in the current outbreak. Yeah. Uh, we we have, you know, we do have uh, a, a reference laboratory at Uganda Virus Research Institute in Tebe, where the initial diagnosis was made. But subsequently, we have a field lab. But a field lab, the the utility or the value of a field lab cannot be imagined, because in the proportion of of, of of three to one yeah. are the are the contacts that you the, the suspected case you have cases you have and you need the shortest time possible to process them and make sure that you separate them and having a fast turnaround time of, of results so the value of, of a field laboratory in the reduction of the turnaround time one and again a faster processing of patients and again, the faster processing of suspect cases and the patients for discharge is invaluable. And I think it's very critical that at the earliest we have, or in any outbreak, we have a field laboratory to be able to, to support the response. And basically, to situate it at the epicenter where you expect to have a lot, lots and lots of patients coming through. Over to you. Maybe Prof. Yes. Muyembe can add. Yes, yes. 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 Professor Muyembe, uh -huh. what is yes. your experience? With the yes, uh, labs. Um, so I think the, um, the field uh, laboratory is very important uh, because you will improve the case management. 
in the field. Instead of waiting the result from uh, the capital or from uh, outside, you have the diagnosis uh, locally at the epicenter of the of the outbreak. So I think the first the first advantage is to um, to uh, exclude other common uh, diseases that have the same symptoms uh, 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 like uh, uh, Ebola. So you have to confirm that it is Ebola. And secondly, if you have the CT, the, 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 the viral load of, of the patient, it is also very important for the clinician to, uh, to adapt uh, his, um, his treatment, his treatment. And, uh, and uh, also sequencing the capacity to sequence the genome of the virus is a very, very important now because you can uh, have uh, some idea on the, um, the contact tracing. Sometimes it is very difficult to have the contact tracing based on the, um, the epidemiological data. So uh, sequencing is a new tool to have a good um, contact tracing. Uh, very accurate contact tracing. Um, so the first thing for us is to, to confirm that it is Ebola Zaire or it is Ebola Sudan. It, it, if it is Ebola Zaire, we have the treatment, we have the vaccine. So if, if, if it is Ebola Sudan, uh, that, that is another question. This is the importance of uh, the lab uh, mobile lab or uh, simply um, uh, the um, gene expert platform, it is enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, th yeah that, can, I say, can I say something about field, field, uh, labor, field laboratories? Please. Uh, our early experience was that the field laboratories were only good for, for uh, confirmation, case confirmation, and also case management. But when it comes to screening patients, uh, in the community and for prevention. I thought the clinical case definition was very, very important. But unfortunately, this case definition needs to be evaluated locally and validated. So I think that's where uh, our, our focus really should be, that for the case definition should be able, uh, each, time, each, each time there is an outbreak, we should quickly uh, put into place a validation exercise or research, make sure that symptoms which, are, which come out, which have been issued out by WHO and other agencies are consistent with the local situations. Uh, because there are so many things here which make it where we have fever, we have uh, bleeding, we have so, uh, this and that. So really what I would say is that you need a concurrent evaluation of the clinical case definition. Over. Okay, I would like to ask another question to uh, Professor Muyembe. Is it possible to carry on with studies in the absence of an active outbreak. I heard uh, Henry Chobe from Uganda now sort of saying, oh, now the patients are not there, we can't test this and so on. Is it possible to grow the virus in uh, uh, some animals so another way so that we can learn how to develop therapeutics and vaccines without an active outbreak? Uh, yes, uh, for me, I think for the first, first, uh, first, first stage of a study, we have to conduct in a P4 lab because you will use the entire virus, and uh, Ebola virus is a, uh, a, a fourth a, a P4. Uh, pathogens, well, the most dangerous in the world. So you cannot handle this uh, virus outside a P4 lab. And uh, to infect cells and to, and to infect uh, non-human primates, you need a P4 lab. But um, if you work only 
on the antigens of the virus or with um, uh, nucleic, uh, with uh, nucleic acids like uh, RNA that you can use outside a P, P, uh, P4 lab. You need a P2 or P3 lab. Uh, most, of our, most of us in Africa, in most of our institution in Africa, we have P2 and P3 lab. So we can uh, conduct a study using PCR or sequencing, but not the culture of uh, the virus. So I think in the first step, we need these uh, studies in America or in South Africa. And the second step, we can conduct in, uh, in Africa, in most of countries in Africa. Over. Yeah, I, I think someone uh, so, uh, should support a scientist like yourself to have a P4 lab. Don't you have a P4 lab, Jack? We we have it. We have two people labs. No, here. no. I, I think I think uh, yeah. It is very very expensive to to run a P four lab. Even our P three lab here in Kinshasa, we are very limited because of uh, the lack of uh, funding. It is very difficult, and I think we are not uh, in Africa. Most of the Arab country. We are not able to, to run a, P, a P4 lab. Uh, we have only one uh, in South Africa. Uh, one of my uh, co uh, colleagues went there for a training. Myself, I was uh, I, I, I received a training, um, but long time ago it was uh, a CDC Africa uh, CDC uh, Atlanta, but uh, it, it is very 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 complicated to to run this kind of, uh, of lab. And also, we must have a lot of uh, scientists trained uh, in this uh, uh, high security uh, lab. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, 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 uh, but I think training is not, not a problem. The problem is to have this lab here in Africa. Yes, Dr. Kware, you have something to say. You say we have two two labs, two P4 labs. I was trying to say that we have the lab in Entebbe is P4, and also at the central central public health laboratory uh, is also P4. So, I, 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 but I think the main problem here will really be what are the outcomes of your research. Well, I thought we've already gone beyond the the laboratory side of uh, laboratory phase. You are now going to test phase one, phase two, phase three of the of your work. So that's why you find it very difficult to get the participants. Uh, it's the participants, I think, who are the problem rather than the lab. The labs are available, but I think it's the participants. Over. Uh, there is a hand up. Esto Bahizire, please uh, step forward. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Good, good evening, according to where you are. Thank you for the wonderful presentations. My question was about uh, the availability of lab uh, in Africa. Yes, it's difficult to run a P4, a biosafety lab for, and uh, the. But now someone has said that in Uganda there are, there are two. Uh, it's somehow good for me of my question because I was wondering uh, how can we. Uh, just uh, not having that such kind of lab, knowing uh, the what we have as a pathogen here. I think our leaders should um, should take this as a security issue for the whole continent. Uh, I, 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 I assume uh, that um, this is something uh, that could be brought to the Africa CDC. I know they are uh, in a process of uh, strengthening uh, capacity lab in uh, uh, African countries. Uh, I think this is um, something we can, uh, as scientists, we can uh, bring uh, on their table. Yeah, this is something that needs to be supported. 
over to you. Thank you. Good point. Introduce yourself. Yeah. Where are you based, yeah. uh, Esto? Yes. I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm uh, I'm, a, I'm a medical doctor from uh, the country of Prof Muyembe. It's a pleasure for me to to be from uh, uh -huh. yeah okay. from um, okay. from Congo. I'm at the Catholic University of Bukavu. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Very good. No. Okay. Uh, yes, Francis. Yes. 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 No, I, I think I was in Uganda. I visited uh, Uvi and also uh, public health laboratory. Uh, uh, but I, I think you, 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 in Uganda, you, there, there is no P4, only P3, P2, P3 laboratory, not, not, not a P4. The only P4 we have in Africa is uh, in South Africa. OK. All right, maybe uh, we have run out of our time and uh, we thank uh, AfriHealth for extending the time. Let's make some suggestions or resolutions for moving forward from the experience which we have had uh, during this webinar. Uh, one of my takeaway is how can we mobilize to build capacity uh, for us to develop therapeutics and vaccines for uh, 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 this uh, hemorrhagic fever, uh, fevers here in in Africa, uh, and maybe uh, you know Jean Jacques and Sam, and uh, you John and Chega, uh, let's say get a, a working group on this with the support of Afri Health, and let's move this agenda forward. I think it's like uh, Esther said, it is a, a security issue. It's a, a, so that is one thing I take from here. Then the other one is, I think, documenting from the current uh, Ugandan outbreak, uh, the behavior of the population. Uh, and I suppose, uh, you know, Jean-Jacques, you said each outbreak has got its own characteristics, but uh, uh, I see that there has always been a delay in picking the cases. What can we do to make uh, early uh, identification of the outbreak? Uh, Dr. Kware said uh, there has never been an index case. They all die. Uh, uh, how can we reduce this? I think, again, uh, moving forward collectively, maybe there should be a community working on uh, this uh, uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers. And again, your leadership, Jean-Jacques, Sam Okware, uh, 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 and uh, uh, Dr. Chiobe, uh, let's take this forward. Uh, and you, uh, John Nashega, uh, and, and let's uh, create a community of practice so that we have regular meetings uh, around uh, these hemorrhagic fevers. And uh, we learn from each other and we agree on how we move forward together. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yes, uh, th those are very good resolutions. So we, we're taking note on those. I would like just to add the last resolution is that, yeah. uh, and Jean-Jacques Mouyembe uh, mentioned that they, they need to train the next generation of uh, scientists, uh, uh, you know, uh, rising star like Harry and other who uh, in this area of imaging and reimaging pathogens. So. Uh, on that note also, Afri Health is contributing. I was in DRC last month uh, to try to, uh, to build capacity of, uh, you know, uh, build a, a, a NIH D43 training grant uh, to between South Africa, DRC, and other partner uh, in the US to train the next generation of people focusing on imaging pathogens like Ebola, uh, monkeypox, COVID, and so on. Uh, and that require not only include uh, building capacity for laboratory, um, uh, you know, taking advantage of advanced country like South Africa in genomics and so on. So Francis, I think uh, we are on the same page and uh, AfriHealth is already uh, tackling some of the issue, but uh, you summarize them quite very well. So let's give a chance to our speakers. Just uh, one or two things you would like to leave behind. We start yes. with uh, you, Henry.
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof, and uh, the, the entire panel for the excellent opportunity to 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 share, but more importantly to learn from uh, across uh, across board from the senior senior colleagues who have been at this for several years. Uh, we know, <clears throat> as uh, the different speakers have spoken, this is not the end of, of outbreaks. And we are going to consistently be seeing them coming more frequent, as you pointed out, because of potential climate change. For the current outbreak in Uganda, we think uh, uh, we are doing as much as possible to limit further spread, but also bearing in mind that we want to maintain our cohesion, cohesion of the community, not to lose them along the way, meaning that we have to, to trade a fine balance of, of response, but making sure that we don't lose the patients, let alone the, the, the population. Also, uh, the, the picture uh, of Ebola now becoming much, much more clear on the clinical side. That some of the technologies, uh, the genomic sequencing, we're using them and they have been very useful for us in the cities to be able to characterize cases, link cases, and uh, much as of course some of the technologies are still a little bit have limitations because we have to have sufficient viral load the city values have to be in a, in a range of under 30 for us to be able to 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 do genomic sequencing but a very vital tools but again as the professor Miyambe said we need to to shift much more to newer tools of response than we traditionally thank you so much and over to you Okay, let's go to uh, yes. Sam. Yes, Chair, I was concerned about the social media. Social media has impacted very negatively in some places when we are trying to do health education. So I really thought that we should get a strategy for the, for, for the management of fear. The, 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 the fear epidemic, the fear is a much worse epidemic than even Ebola itself. So I really thought perhaps that could actually be the agencies and other people who are interested to actually take this up to see how they can be able to manage fear, uh, the management of fear and, rumor among, and, rumor, and rumors. The second point is the centers of excellence. Uh, already in Tebe, for instance, we, we are centers of excellence for a number of emerging and re-emerging infections. I think it might be nice for us to share a few ideas on how we can embrace this uh, to the best of the region or the rest of the continent. This is, could be possible through WHO or through other regional agencies like, uh, like Africa. CDC. And finally, uh, the issue of exchange, technical exchange of um, uh, just this, for instance, center A going to center B, you know, to see what is actually happening. Uh, I think a program for exchange of uh, uh, exchange risks, uh, doctors, that type of thing, experience, that actually can be very, very helpful. And finally, of course, we need to have, before we do that, we need to have an inventory of ongoing research and the continent and ongoing centers of excellence. Over. Okay, Jean-Jacques, as you start, there is a question for you in the chat. It is asking whether it is possible to repurpose the therapeutics which are working for Ebola Zaire for Ebola Sudan uh, on top of other things that you would like to say as your parting words. Um, yes, so the, um, what we did uh, is now possible to use this uh, methodology to, to develop other monoclonal antibodies against other type of uh, Ebola virus, I mean uh, Ebola Sudan. And Ebola Bundibudio. Ebola Sudan is circulating in, in, uh, in Uganda and in Sudan, in South Sudan. Uh, we did not have this uh, in, in DRC, but uh, Bundibudio is circulating in Uganda and in DRC. So uh, for us, we have to, the, the priority is to develop uh, monoclonal antibodies for the treatment of these uh, uh, two um, uh, Ebola virus circulating uh, in both in uh, Uganda and uh, DRC. 
and also uh, to uh, to uh, develop a vaccine because we, we have now we now we have the technology to do that so what can we do uh, 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 we need funding we need this kind of uh, local leadership and also uh, to work uh, in a team, multi-disciplinary uh, team, because Ebola is not only a medical problem, but it's a social problem. And to fight against Ebola, we need we need uh, community engagement. Uh, this is very very important. I think two things are very important to 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 control Ebola. It is the local leadership, somebody who has the capacity for research and for epidemiology will be the chief. And also to have uh, uh, anthropologists to, to give a good information to the population and to understand the perception of the, the community for the, the for Ebola. So this is uh, the combination of for all these of the scientists and anthropologists and other. It is very important to uh, to control Ebola outbreaks in uh, in Africa. Over. Well, thank you. I have nothing else to add. I will hand over to you, John Nashega. It's been a great experience for me. And I think uh, from today, uh, control of this uh, hemorrhagic fevers will have a new direction for Africa. Over to you, John. No, th thank you. I would like to, to thank all the speakers for the brilliant uh, uh, talks and also the very vibrant discussion and the interest. We, this was, uh, webinar was recorded. It's going to be posted on AfriHealth. Uh, website. Uh, uh, Elsie Kiguli and myself, we're going to try to follow up with some writing uh, through the Africa Health Journal uh, about this and maybe other venue. Uh, and uh, we, I will be in touch with the uh, specific speaker for their contribution on that note also. So uh, uh, I would like also to thank all the participants uh, uh, who connected from US, uh, from, uh, from, from Africa, and I got, I saw some from uh, from Europe. Um, uh, and again, uh, we will continue this discussion. And uh, uh, at the end, I would like also uh, to reiterate uh, really the need uh, for building capacity uh, for emerging pathogen on the continent for the young generation. Uh, and again, I'm really committed through Afri Health and NIH Fogarty on this. And I'm working closely with uh, INRB in Kinshasa and the Afri Health. Uh, and we will be connecting with other country, uh, starting with South Africa. And uh, so I'm good. I'm good that I have the, my network uh, increased to Uganda, and uh, we can uh, we will be reaching out uh, also soon. Uh, so thank you, everyone, and uh, everyone a, a happy, uh, nice weekend. Uh, for those who are in the US, it's uh, uh, Black Friday, uh, long uh, Thanksgiving weekend. I'm connecting from Cape Town, beautiful Cape Town summer. It's really nice here in Uganda. You probably uh, in the evening, and uh, it's start to be dark. Uh, but again, it was really a pleasure to uh, uh, to 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 commoderate this with uh, our uh, really uh, senior uh, Prof. Francis Omaswa, who, by the way, share did share the price, the Idego price with Jean Jacques Muyembe in Japan. Uh, so it's really. Uh, <laughs> It's, it, it, we have really great caliber on this webinar, and it's really, again, a pleasure and honor uh, for to have my senior uh, to, 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 to commoderate with, with them. So thank you, everyone, and uh, we will be in touch through AfriHealth. Thank you. Bye-bye.